So welcome back. So here we're talking about energy gaining pleasure. So this is one of the main differences, um, if you will, between tantric sex and regular sex. So in tantric sex, there's an understanding that you take the sexual energy um, away from just having it being, you know, restricted to the genital area and you move it through your entire body. And one of the best ways to move it is through moving it through the energy channels because the energy channels are there as we learned. So this is a chart from the multi-orgasmic couple and it shows um, sort of like the difference between a regular orgasm. So here you feel the pleasure primarily in your genitals. This is the um, orgasm. So for a man, this is when they ejaculate. This is when all the contractions happen in a woman's uh, pelvic floor and her uterus and in all of the organs and tissues in the pelvic floor. And then this is called the resolution phase where for men, they often get really tired because um, the vital essence of our sexual energy is stored in the egg and the sperm. So when a man ejaculates, he is essentially spending his energy. Um, this happens for a woman every month when she loses her egg. So the woman's vital essence is contained in the ovaries. And um, so as most men know, and may, maybe most women know, that this is uh, the point of no return means, you know, for most men, they need a while to recover. They need a while to recover this energy. Um, it's suggested, you know, in, in Tantra that um, men can uh, ejaculate, can have an orgasm separate from ejaculation. So many people think that ejaculation and orgasm happens all together at once for men, and that's often how it does. But those two things can be separated. So a man can still have an orgasm, but not ejaculate. And when he doesn't ejaculate, that means he retains his energy and he can take his energy from the penis and move it up the spine to the crown of the head, just like a woman can. So in a, um, the orgasmic upward draw, you would feel the pleasure in your genitals as a, as a woman. And then you would expand the pleasure up your spine. So here you're drawing energy up the spine to the brain using the orgasmic upward draw. So that starts to take the energy from the genitals and it spreads it out through the whole body. It takes that orgasmic energy to all parts of your body that may need it for healing. Um, so the pleasure also floods your brain. The pleasure pulses through the entire body. And if you're, uh, you can do this alone. You don't have to do this with another person. Um, if you are uh, making love to yourself, um, it can be an amazing experience. Like, a full body orgasm or a kind of a spiritual experience. I've had different experiences in tantric, um, the tantric courses that I've taken um, and that I, I teach at where when you pull the sexual energy up to the brain, you feel all the glands in the brain explode open and, and it's like all this spiritual energy kind of comes in and penetrates you through the crown of the head. And then that cascades down through the body in this like really pleasurable feeling and for me i also saw visions of like jewels like rainbow colored jewels through the body i felt the energy of what i would call jesus it was jesus to me came through my body and was said everything is sacred and went right down through my legs and into the ground saying everything is sacred and i, I also felt other um spiritual uh spirits 
there. I felt Mother Teresa, I felt Osho uh, there, and they were, each of them was sort of like doing something different. So anyway, that's just like an example. There's, there's, there's lots of different experiences you can have um, through energy gaining pleasure and spreading the sexual energy through the whole body. Um, if you are making love with uh, another person, um, you can feel like the boundaries between you and your partner dissolve and also um, tra uh, experience a transformation of consciousness. So uh, that's just a side effect of, of these practices. But um, it can be very bonding experience. It can be taking your lovemaking to a whole other level. Um, and yeah, you need some time to cultivate this on your own um, before you do it with a partner so that your body and your energy knows how to do it. So it's perfectly great to start these kinds of practices on your own. And it's suggested that they are practiced on your own first and then with a partner. So men don't um, have to ejaculate. In fact, it's recommended that men ejaculate something like once every in every 10 times. In that way, they are conserving their energy and their energy can be uh, put to other things like, um, you know, look, looking after maybe a wife with small kids, like, and helping the wife to do things or, or, um, yeah, taking the kids while the wife, you know, goes and takes a break or, and, or any combination of, of family types. Um, I recognize not all family types are male, female, or man, women. Um, so again, from the Awakening Healing Light of the Tao by Montek Chia, uh, there's different ways in which we lose energy. So work, talking, reading, losing energy pleasure. So for men, it's ejaculation. Um, for women, as I said, uh, menstruating and ovulation and uh, and you know having a child inside of us and then giving birth and then rearing a child is a huge energy expenditure for women so it can take a while for a woman to regain her energy um, after having a child. She really needs to focus on herself and replenish her energy and nurture herself um, as much as possible and breathe into that, you know, original chi area. And doing these kinds of practices, uh, the chi vong and the tantra practices, can help her to regain a lot of her energy after um, giving birth and uh, rearing a young child because that child is literally stuck to her body uh, and feeding off of her energy for the first two to four years. Negative emotions take a lot of energy. <laughs> Not expressing those emotions uh, or repressing and suppressing emotions um, also take a lot of energy. So that's the way we lose energy. Um, we also lose energy when it's focused outward, so outside the self and out into senses, like gaining pleasure through uh, the eyes and the ears and the, all the senses, um, if we're overly focused on that. Um, improper dry diet environment uh, or nourishment, uh, like toxins or drugs. Um, uh, toxins can be environmental. You can be working in a toxic environment, you know, where you know it's not good for you. That can take your energy. Also, trauma, um, stuff that we that we inherit from our ancestors, uh, energetic cords that are connected between us and other people, uh, invisible cords um, from usually from intimate and deep relationships or like relationships between our parents and us. Um, so those are ancestral imprint prints and uh, other energy blockages, which can be mental, emotional, and physical. So those are the ways that we lose energy. Okay, so now women are like water and men are like fire. So women take a long time to heat up sexually. Um, and 
they stay hot for a long time. So a woman's average time to orgasm can be from 20 minutes to 40 minutes. It takes women a long time to heat up. Women are like water. Men, on the other hand, are like fire. So this is an important distinguishment to make between the sexes. Uh, yang energy is quick to light and quick to explode. So the average time to orgasm for a man is two to five minutes. This is a difference that's worth paying attention to and is taught a lot about in Tantra because of these differences between in men, men and women, we need to know the differences so that we can have like a harmonious relationship and harmonious sex together. Ah, Christian Northrop, that was the doctor's name that I was struggling to remember from Women's Bodies, Women's Wisdom. This is a um, picture from one of her books, just showing another diagram of men's energy primarily being more mental and coming down and women's energy being more centered around the lower part of the half of the body um, and coming from the earth and going up. So, so this picture is from Tantric Love. It's one of my favorite Tantra books um, written by, um, I'm just gonna put my glasses on, uh, Ananda Sarita and uh, Swami, oh gosh, I can't read it, it's too small. But um, these are people who studied with Osho and they teach uh, a lot. Um, from Osho. Osho had a Tantra temple in India for a long time. And uh, he had um, a lot of people at his temple. He was, he was teaching them Tantra. So this is uh, very cool and interesting to note um, where we've got all these uh, energy centers. So this is more from a Indian yogic perspective and it's showing the chakras. So the chakra energy centers. I'm not gonna go into talking about the chakras a lot, just want to show you that um, the man's first chakra is a positive pole and the woman's first chakra is a negative pole. Now, the woman's belly here is a positive pole. So we actually have a physical object here, physical anatomy protruding out. And then when women get pregnant, their belly gets big, so they protrude out as well. And this is kind of like an emotional center as well. So women's bellies are positive, or second chakra is positive, and men's negative. And then men have a positive pole in the third chakra, the power center or the will center, and women have a negative pole here. Here again, we have physical anatomical structure with, which protrudes, and we have a positive pole from the heart into the man's heart. Man has a positive pole in his throat, and women a negative pole, and then women have a positive pole in the third eye, and men have a negative pole. So it just kind of goes to show you like the women's emotional and this is also another emotional center and this is a center for intuition. These are kind of like the women's, women's strengths, like the women's heart center and her emotional center and her belly um, is more yang than a man's. A man's um, power center and throat center are more and his sexual center are more yang. So, so uh, the man's positive pole, actually, he gives love a lot through his penis into a woman. Um, and women really give a lot in a sexual exchange through their heart into the man. So the man has to also be open to receive the woman's emotions into his heart. Um, often, because women's uh, sexual area is a negative pole, they often need to warm up their sexual center from their other positive centers, their emotional center and their heart center. 
Um, and they often need to do that or they need help to do that as well through um, positive emotional regard, like a lot of care and tenderness and attention uh, for themselves, on themselves, with themselves, for themselves, but also from their partner before this center will open. And then, of course, a man's penis can help the woman's um, root chakra uh, to open by his fire. Um, so she's more watery here and he's more fire. And she can help to open up his heart with the love from her heart. So it's often said in Tantra that women give their love through their heart and then men give their love through, their pen through the penis and then the energy circulates between the both of them. So from the Essence of Tantric Sexuality book, um, this is a, um, they were talking about primary, secondary, and tertiary erot, erot, <laughs> erogenous zones. Um, and it is commonly uh, talked about in Tantra about how women are stimulated from distally to, from the outside to the inside. Okay, so from the tip of the toes into the center, from the hands into the arms, into the breast, from outside in. And men uh, tend to be aroused from the inside out. So they get aroused and then it's, it's important to spread the energy from the sexual center out into the body. Women are warmed up from the outside in. So Basically, um, as stated by Mantecchia, women need foreplay. They need to be caressed tenderly and embraced with passion. So um, women sometimes need like a whole day or two days of subtle foreplay. This can just be touch, um, attention, uh, caring. Um, you know, this is where romance comes in. Her heart and her emotions actually need to be into it to open her own sexual center. So intimacy is really key for women and for arousing women. Even, you know, uh, their mind, you know, having their mind stimulated. And, uh, that's really important as well. Um, women or those with ovaries often need to feel, and this is true for men too. I'm not saying it's not true for men, but more so for women. They need to feel the emotional bond through intimacy, through eye contact and the presence of the masculine. So presence isn't something else that's taught about in Tantra. Men need to be very present with their woman. Just the same as women's masculine, my own masculine energy needs to be very present with my own feminine energy to open it up. So I need to pay attention to myself to open myself up. To open myself up sexually, I need to be present with my own genitals and my own arousal and what stimulates me. So it happens inside of us, but also in between us in relationships. Women need to feel there is an exchange of energy, okay? That they are receiving and the other person is giving and also that they are giving and the other person is receiving. Um, a lot of the time, I get the impression that a lot of women feel like they're not receiving. And that might be partly their own fault. Maybe they have control issues. They can't surrender. They are frigid. There's lots of problems. We're going to go into what those common problems may be. Um, and, um, but often women feel like they're just like, okay, my partner's horny. I don't feel like it. So she's having sex but she doesn't feel like she's actually receiving she's feels like she's being taken from or used so um we both need to feel like we are receiving pleasure in sex um women seem to also need deep passionate sex for a longer time 
to get to higher states of arousal and bliss and need to be stimulated from the outside in. So it takes a longer time for a woman to heat up. As you saw, women are like water. And there's a saying in the Taoist, um, in the Taoist, uh, in Taoism, it says, don't float your boat in a rocky river. That means uh, you need to wait until a woman is aroused, until she is wet before having sex. Um, so women are actually considered the stronger sex. We, um, the men actually need to learn how to hold back and refrain from ejaculating so they can get us hotter and hotter and hotter. So men need to train their, their own responses, their sexual responses to delay ejaculation. So they have the energy to be able to get the woman to higher, higher states of arousal. Um, women can often get bored and I, men also can also get bored when lovemaking is always the same. That's why it's really important for, um, for women to explore, um, new things, keep things interesting, explore their own body, find out what turns them on, what doesn't turn them on. Um, spontaneity and playfulness. Playfulness is more of a feminine, sensual quality. Keeping things spontaneous and playful is really important to keep things interesting. And then women also need to know their own body as well through sexual exploration to know what turns them on. So some common problems in women's sexual, sexual energy um, stress. So we need to balance work and rest, balance uh, the elements or the emotions, and to feel calm and joyful. So the more relaxed we are, that's going to be one of the best medicines that we have for our sexual energy. Frigidity. So this often, often um, uh, has to do with unresolved trauma or fear or low self-worth, low self-regard. Um, or the heart center is closed, and for some reason, energy is shut down. That creates frigidity. Lack of exercise. So keeping energy circulating in the body, so the blood and the lymph and all the fluids in the body increases arousal and also body confidence. Just the fact that you're paying attention to your body increases your connection to your body and your body confidence. Uh, boredom. So another common problem is the dynamics of interaction may be lackluster or lacking intimacy. So this may need to be worked on. Uh, falling out of love is a common problem that women have uh, with their sexual desire. It's like, you know, you can try to fake it, but it doesn't feel very good to fake it. It's better when it's actually, you know, passionate and hot for you. So uh, if the emotional bond is gone between a couple, then what's the point? Um, exhaustion. So this is something that's commonly found uh, with women with small children. Um, they have no libido left because they have no energy. So if, we, if you remember back to the picture of the kidneys, um, the sexual energy is the first energy to go when we have a health crisis. So the libido can go first. Uh, when someone's raising a small child and not sleeping and uh, really focusing on keeping the baby alive, they can have very low energy um, and that's what the libido will suffer. Um, often I found, find that um, a lot of people can be in their head um, and not so much in the body. So an overly mental person, uh, that can be due to trauma uh, to escape feelings of fear. So to escape the emotional centers, we often come up into our head, into our mind. Um, this also comes from a lack of focusing on the present moment. Um, anxiety and worry issues, which are connected to the spleen, if you remember, the spleen, stomach, pancreas. Not being able to receive pleasure in life. So this might be a person who just never makes time for themselves. Um, so why should they receive pleasure in sex if they can't even, you know, 
do something pleasurable or nice for themselves any other day. So these people need to learn how to receive in life. They need to learn how to receive pleasure, to have a good time, and also to receive during sex. Um, they, are, they need to also make space to relax and enjoy life and enjoy themselves. Um, there can be an over-controlling, so a need to relax and surrender and trust. So a trust is connected to the spleen, stomach, and pancreas. Overprotective of the self after children. So basically, this is kind of like the low energy thing. So they've given so much energy to the children, they haven't had enough energy for themselves and they haven't regained their energy after childbirth. Um, so there's a need to learn, you know, boundaries be like, nope, this is the time for mom. I'm going to do this for myself um, and look after yourself. Um, and then, you know, but not to say no all the time. It's like learning to say no when you really need to say no. And also then learning to say yes when you can say yes. But this flexibility of boundaries is the ability to say yes and no, just not always like, no, 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 no. I'm not giving this. I'm not giving that. I'm not giving that. It's like you do need to learn how to have your own boundaries and look after them. But boundaries are flexible. They can move and change. Um, another common problem is tired of being complacent and giving. So they may feel that their partner is taking from them. So this is, again, a need for boundaries. Um, and they may also feel like, you know, their life is dictated by the needs of others rather than themselves. So that might be like that flag of, oh, I'm not going to cooperate anymore. I am not giving anything else ever again. If you've been that way your whole life, then you might be going through a phase where you don't want to do shit for anybody else. Excuse my language. Um, and of course, there's many health issues associated with the sexual organs, pain and lack of lubrication during menopause. So there's all different kinds of health issues that could be going on. Um, but the important thing to know here is that yin and yang actually balance each other out. So this is an image from Cultivating Female Sexual Energy by Mantak Chia. It shows the man sitting and the woman sitting on top. And this is called the yab yum position. It's also showing the energy channels of the body. So how the energy is is circulating through both of their bodies. And this is the Wu Ji, the grand ultimate, splitting into both the masculine and the feminine. So yin and yang balance each other out. The masculine presence or consciousness and feminine life force flow. It's kind of like a flower growing towards the sun. The feminine needs the loving masculine presence to grow and shine and vice versa. Both men and women have masculine and feminine within themselves, and they can cultivate both within themselves. Um, as I have learned, one of the most important marriages that I have entered into is that marriage of my own inner masculine and feminine. So I am literally married to myself. And a great way to do this is through one of the foundational Taoist practices or Qigong practices called the inner smile meditation. And we talked a little bit about the polarity between yin and yang. So polarity is that magnetic attraction. When positive and negative meet, they are attracted and dance around each other. That also is true of just within ourselves. This is a negative pole and this is a positive pole. So when you circulate energy in the microcosmic orbit, when you go up and down, up the back, down the front, up the back, down the front, or up the front, down the back, up the front, down the back, up the front, down the back, you're essentially circulating energy between your positive and negative pole, and that makes you more magnetic and attractive. So I've done, I do this work with individuals and groups, and I often warn them and say, okay, so now that you're practicing Tantra, 
you will notice that different people will become more attracted to you because you're making yourself more magnetic by doing these practices. And it's true, I've had, you know, 50 something year old men, you know, that I've worked with for issues like prostate cancer and start teaching them this and practicing this with them. And they'll come back to me and say, oh my gosh, a 30 year old gave me her number. It's like out of the blue, kind of blows them away. Um, and I've noticed it for myself too. When I started practicing Tantra, I started also attracting other Tantric lovers uh, who had that, you know, like uh, something, something about our energy is attracting each other. Um, so yes, when you kiss and feel sparks, it's your microcosmic orbits meeting and stirring each other's energy. So microcosmic orbit, you know, we said it comes, over the head and down to the roof of the mouth. And when you touch your tongue to the roof of your mouth, it goes down through the tongue and down into the body. So your tongue is, um, is a point uh, when you touch, if you touch another person's tongue, like through kissing, where your microcosmic orbits are meeting. So you can like feel the other person's sexual energy through your tongue. That's why kissing is so amazing because we can feel that whole other person's energy through their tongue. And we have the potential to heal each other. So this is called the healing love practices of the Tao. So we're gonna get into a little bit of uh, just, you know, some anatomy talk and then talking a little bit more about female uh, orgasm and other juicy topics. So, We've got uh, some anatomy here. There's this soft area on your pubic bone, which you can just, if you wanna reach down and touch your pubic bone, it's called the mons pubis or the mound of Venus. And then we've got the hood of the clitoris um, or the glands of the clitoris. And sorry, the glands of the clitoris here. Sorry, this is the hood or the precipice of the clitoris. I'm getting ahead of myself. So this is the clitoral bud here, or glands of the clitoris. And then you've got the outer lips and the inner lips. You've got the opening to the urethra, where your pee comes out. You've got the opening to the vagina. Um, other fancy things here, you want to look at all the scientific words, but um, a frenulum, this is the frenulum, the bottom of the large lips or labia majora. And this is the perineum. Uh, this is, when we talk about the perineum, we usually, we're talking really about the whole pelvic floor, but more specifically right here, this uh, area, perineal rat rafe. I don't know how to say that. Ah. <laughs> and uh, the other opening, which is it's an anus. So a view of the pelvis, so the female pelvis, is this one right here. You can see it's quite large and cavernous so that we can fit a baby inside. And here's a male's pubic bone. You can see it's quite a bit more narrow. There's less of an angle here. The sit bones are further apart. The male sit bones are quite a bit closer together. So very different uh, pelvic bones. And this is from the clitoral truth. I liked these pictures of the muscles because they went from the outer layer to the inner layer. So you could get a layer by layer view. So we've got ring muscles, it's like a figure eight. Here they kind of detach them so you can see what's underneath. But see this big figure eight? These are ring muscles. So if you squeeze your eyes together, or first your lips, like you're about to kiss somebody, or your anus, those are all ring muscles. So there's ring muscles around the anus, around the mouth, around the eyes, and around the vagina. 
and the opening and the whole vagina contains ring muscles. Um, so we have the all the specific muscles here: ischiocavernous muscle, vulval cavernous muscle, um, the transverse perineal muscle, the anus, the anal sphincter. Here, these ring muscles. Um, there's the tailbone at the back. So then, the next layer in, you have the urogenital diaphragm here, which holds up the uh, uterus, the vagina, and the bladder. It's very important, diaphragm. And then the next layer of muscles, this is the inner layer, shows the levator ani muscles. Uh, so a little bit deeper here. This is a, a frontal view. So you can see your genital diaphragm um, right here, the later ani. So yeah, just interesting to look at all the layers of muscles. And we actually learn a lot about how to contract these muscles and to articulate all of these muscles in the pelvic floor which are usually under subconscious control. You know, we use them to go poo, we use them to go pee or to stop the pee or to stop the poo. But um, most people don't actually <coughs> learn a lot about how to connect to those muscles and control them. We'll talk a little bit more about that later because these are specific practices in the Tao Tantric uh, practices. But what I want to show you here um, that lies between the first layer, remember those, that figure eight? So under that figure eight and, but below the urogenital diaphragm, we have the clitoris. So this book, The Clitoral Truth, Clitoral Truth, was such an interesting read. I highly recommend it. It was talking about the case of the missing clitoris. I found this really interesting. I found it really interesting that we haven't really medically, in medical textbooks, known how big this tissue of the clitoris is until very recently like i'm talking 1980s okay so again the female body is inside it's hidden and there was a lot of focus uh around men and on men in many of the centuries leading up until now so much so that the clitoris didn't even appear in medical textbooks but now we know that we have this huge structure. There's legs of the clitoris. There's bulbs to the clitoris. There's this whole urethral sponge. This little thing that we feel is often just the glands and the shaft of the clitoris but it goes way deep inside our body. And then of course you've got the perineal sponge as well. And the vulvo vagina glands that feed that juicy uh, liquidy stuff into the vagina. So it's a very large structure inside. And this is another view. So that's what we usually see outside, you see the clitoris, um, but there it is, this whole thing. So that was a really good read um, from The Clitoral Truth and very interesting because she goes back into history and like, you know, talks about all the people who've been like on this case of the missing clitoris and I think one of the most interesting things, uh, most interesting commentaries from the book was like, you know, that 
the women's genitalia has paralleled women's rights, basically. <laughs> As women have gotten more rights throughout history, our genitalia has been discovered more and revealed more. So it's like, kind of goes to show you how sexual energy is power in a way. And it is a huge power. Here's another view of the clitoris from uh, Christian Northrop's book, Women's Bodies, Women's Wisdom. So you can see another view. So um, when a woman becomes sexually excited, so all the tissues around this area seem to expand and get engorged with blood, as seen in this uh, diagram that I pulled off of the internet from Dimensions of Human Sexuality, Gra and Hill Companies. So um, there are some other drawings that I saw that I really liked from Female Anatomy of Arousal. I don't have that book though, but I'd like to get it. Um, and they had like sketches or somebody did drawings of an actual woman's um, whole vulva and how puffed up it was and expanded with, uh, so you can imagine, you know, the, those ring muscles that figure eight, those ring muscles around here. And then right under that layer of muscle, you've got the clip, the clitoris. And so this is like all the tissues around and the clitoris itself becoming really engorged with uh, blood and expanding. And this makes uh, sex and penetration more pleasurable. So I recently had a partner a sexual partner who um, was like, I don't know, he's like, you take so long to have an orgasm. I'm like, dude, like, come on, just spend some time, you know, like it takes women a longer time than men. And I don't know, he should have known this. He's a grown man. But anyway, um, I guess he didn't. Um, I actually found out later that I had a little bit of nerve damage from uh, mountain biking. So it was taking me longer to have an orgasm, but uh, I was a little bit insulted, I will admit. Um, and I was trying to get across the importance of the fact that I needed to be stimulated a lot first, because when this area is really puffed up and engorged with blood, then penetration um, of the penis for another sex toy is more pleasurable because it's all like puffed up and bigger and engorged and there's more senses and I mean it's more lubricated and you feel more pleasure inside the vagina. So another reason to really spend a long time to um, make sure that you're fully aroused before having sex. And, you know, having sex before you're fully aroused can be difficult because you may be drier and you, you won't get to higher and higher states of pleasure um, because that's kind of the first gate. The clitoris is the first gate. So it helps us to get aroused. Just like thinking about things can help us to get aroused or the Taoist practices, uh, Jadic practices, which we'll talk about, um, of contracting and releasing all these pelvic floor muscles um, can help us to become more aroused. So if you find that you have difficulties becoming aroused, really getting to know this area and doing these practices, contracting and releasing the pelvic floor muscles, um, and that means contraction and then relaxation can really help to uh, increase your uh, arousal. And it's just good to connect with this part of the body. So um, the other thing that I wanted to touch in on, which was written about in the clitoral truth, <laughs> was the topic of squirting. Um, 
And there seems to be a bit of a debate in the medical community as to whether squirting actually does exist, if you can believe it or not. I know it exists because it happens to me. And um, many women have experienced squirting. Um, but anyway, it's just interesting that um, people in medical field would even refute the existence of squirting <laughs> because they don't understand it. So I learned about squirting through a movie called um, uh, Divine Nectar. And um, this is an amazing movie that uh, can empower women around uh, their own divine nectars, the Amrita or the nectar of the gods as it's called, uh, is um, a fluid that comes out of the urethral opening. So the same opening as where the pee comes out, but the fluid is not pee. So again, this is information that I'm starting to make its way into our culture and our world. Um, and uh, it's been kind of a hidden, another hidden mystery <laughs> of female sexuality. And there's a lot of debate as to what it is and where it comes from, but we are starting to understand that it's not urine for sure. It's not the same as urine. It may come from the um, urethral sponge. There's all these ducts in here. Um, it may actually come right through the fluids of the body from the kidney down through the bladder and out the urethra. So, because if you've squirted before, you might have observed that there can be a ton of water like i squirted seven times in one um one evening of sexual intercourse seven times and each time the water was about like that much that wasn't all coming from the urethral sponge that was coming from other places in my body we are filled with water um, so we often believe in Taoist, Taoists often believe that um, it can come right from the kidneys, it can come right through the tissues of the body, right through the bladder. But anyway, it's a, a very highly regarded nectar. You'd be lucky to drink it or have it squirted all over you. <laughs> and it's pretty fun. So we'll get back a little bit more to squirting and the clitoris in a moment uh, and how it's connected to orgasm. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about sexual reflexology. So sexual reflexology is another thing we teach in Tao Tantric Arts, in Tao Tantra. Um, this is a picture from the multi-orgasmic couple, and it's showing the sexual reflexology zones of the sexual organ. So some of you may know we've got reflexology zones in the ear, we've got them in the hand, we've got them at the bottom of the foot, um, you know, we've got them in the abdomen. So different parts of our body connect to different parts of our body. You can press a point on the bottom of the foot that like, you know, connects to your spine. Same thing in the genitals. In fact, Chinese medicine doctors used to prescribe herbs and acupuncture to keep their patients healthy and strong, but they also prescribed sexual positions because they knew of these sexual reflexology zones and they knew that the energy of yin and yang can help to harmonize each other they would send a person home or a couple home with certain positions to do that would stimulate different zones so here's the male penis and the male sexual reflexology zones and as you can see, here is the female and the female sexual reflexology zones. And guess what? They match up 
perfectly. Another amazing fact that I didn't learn until I was in my 30s. But the opening of the vagina here, and seen here in this picture, the opening is called the first gate. And that is the sexual reflexology zone of the kidney. The kidney, so we need to feel, we're gonna go into this later. Uh, these areas correspond with different emotions and different feelings. So this is where you may be entered, this is where the clitoris is, and the clitoris also corresponds to the adrenal and the thymus gland in this area, and to the pineal and pituitary gland. Those are the glands, master glands in the head. Adrenals are on top of the kidneys, and the thymus gland is right here on top of the heart. It has to do with the immune system. The next layer in, is the uh, liver reflexology zone. And then you have the spleen, stomach pancreas zone. And then up by the cervix, you have the heart and the lung zone. So I've discovered these zones by um, uh, through the jade egg practices. And um, again, we also have all these ring muscles going around these zones. So we can actually like contract them. And one thing that we learn how to do with the jade egg is we learn how to contract, you know, like the lower zone. So just contract this area and then contract the middle area and then contract the upper area. So we learn all this pelvic floor and muscular articulation to actually stimulate different parts of the reflexology zones. I learned more about this. I studied um, different types of therapeutic uh, body work that incorporate the sexual organs. So this is a lot more common in uh, Chinese medicine. The practice is called Kar Sai Mei Tsang. And um, it actually, you don't actually do massage of the internal inside the vagina in Kar Sai Mei Tsang. But um, that is a sexual kind of medical massage um, that's more common in Thailand, um, as far as I know. Um, but I've also learned uh, sort of different massage techniques for women. Um, and I saw how when you press different zones, it brings up the different emotions from the different uh, areas that you're working with. So like the kidney zone can hold a lot of fear. So um, the heart and lung zone can hold a lot of uh, sadness and grief um, or joy. <laughs> you know, it's both positive and negative. I had my, this area massaged way up around the cervix during the course where I was studying some of this work. And I had had a cold like two weeks previous to that. And the cold was gone. Like I wasn't coughing. I didn't have any mucus or anything. But when this area of my body was massaged right around the cervix, I started coughing up phlegm. So it actually helped expel what left, what phlegm was left inside the lungs. So I got to see for myself how all these zones through doing this kind of massage work um, is connected to the different organs. I thought that is very interesting. So now, um, so sexual reflexology and becoming multi-orgasmic. Multi so there's different gates. So the first gate um, is in the kidney zone. So that's where the clitoris and the opening of the vagina was. So in order to activate this zone, there needs to be a feeling of safety. So a woman needs to feel safe um, if she's by herself or safe with the person that she's with. Um, stimulating the zone, so stimulating the clitoris, stimulates the glands and it produces clear fluid for lubrication. And it engorges the first zone for more pleasure in the whole vagina. It's a very personal zone because we can stimulate it ourselves very easily with our own hands, our own fingers. Um, and it can produce an incredible orgasmic rush. The second gate is the G-spot, and that is located 
in the spleen and liver zone. So I should probably have a picture of this. Let's see if I have a picture next. Not quite. So if you are putting your fingers inside of woman's vagina, this is very hard to do to yourself, by the way. Um, but if you have a toy that's got like a little bit of an upward curve, so let's say I am going in, I've got one knuckle deep and about two knuckles deep, just going in through the opening of the vagina and up behind the pubic bone. So as you go in the entrance and you press up, you'll feel the pubic bone. And then right behind the pubic bone, so you kind of have to curl your fingers like this, will be the G spot. And the G spot is kind of like, it's kind of ridged, sort of like the roof of your mouth when you run your tongue along the roof of your mouth. So this is in the spleen and liver zone. Um, and the orgasm here is very cleansing. It's the squirting orgasm. Um, it can really flush out a lot of fluid uh, through your body. So it feels like actually really refreshing. It's like, it's like, yeah, it's like, it's very cleansing. I have noticed personally. Um, the spleen and liver zones uh, create a real animal-like intensity. The liver is that energy of, you know, uh, it can be very animalistic feeling, energy, very passionate energy. Um, the ejaculation fluid is called amrita, coming from the urethral sponge, maybe the kidneys, maybe uh, fluid coming from inside the body. Um, and it feels like you have to pee. So there needs to be a feeling of deep trust and openness. So remember liver and spleen. The spleen was about trust and uh, openness to receive. Um, and also a willingness to surrender. So this is a connective, can be a, a good connective activity. So um, I, you can ejaculate on your own. I taught myself how to, but you need to have a toy that you can do it with. But it's very um, helpful if you have someone to help you using their fingers, um, stimulating the clitoris and getting everything engorged first. And it's really nice to be stimulated on the clitoris and have the G-spot um, stimulated at the same time. But you don't need to have the G-spot particularly stimulated to squirt. Some people can just use the contraction of their own muscles. The third gate is the cervix. So this is the heart and lung zone. Um, and orgasm in this area can feel deeply emotional, can be uh, very vulnerable. Um, I find it to be like, it's like my heart bursts open and I cry. So um, a lot of like feelings of love and like, I don't know, just really emotional um, is, is how I've experienced it. And this really opens up the core channel and the connection between the vagina and the heart and the lungs. So it uh, can produce really deep connective feelings between you and your partner um, to have this area stimulated. And the third fluid from the cervix um, and deep in the vagina, um, I don't know if it has a name, but Minka DeVos, my teacher, called it the bliss pearl cervical fluid. Um, if this area, like if the cervix is, is thrust too hard, so, you know, different vagina sizes and different penis sizes, sometimes they don't match up. A penis can be a lot longer than a vagina. So um, if a person is kind of banging you pretty hard and their end of their penis is hitting the cervix, so if the thrusting is too hard, it can actually shut the heart down. So it's not really size that matters so much as the fit. So those are the three gates of orgasm. 
So I've been talking a little bit about Tao Tantra and the Jade Egg, a girl's best friend. And here's an image of an image of Jade Eggs that I um, get. I order them in bulk and then I make uh, these beaded pull cords. So these are for pulling on. So this part goes into the vagina to stimulate the reflexology zones. And then this part is used to hold on to. So essentially you pull down on the string and you squeeze your muscles and pull up on the egg. And by pulling up and contracting the pelvic floor muscles, you also circulate the energy through the different energy channels. So here's an image of, uh, from Tao Tantric Arts for Women, picture of Minka DeVos illustrated, pulling down and then the muscles pulling up. And she's pulling the sexual energy up and connecting with the energy of her heart. But you can see the energy also going up and connecting into the throat, going up into the third eye, and overflowing like a fountain all the way out of her crown and all over her body. So the jade egg is not about just doing pelvic floor muscle contractions. It's about moving the energy from the different energy channels. And then as shown here in Healing Love Through the Tao by Montak Chia, we show... Um, how different parts of the pelvic floor and muscles around the anus connect to different parts of the body. So here is the middle of the anus and shows the energy going up through the middle pathways, through the pituitary gland, the pineal gland, the thyroid gland, the heart, the stomach, the vena cava. Uh, contracting the rear of the anus or the rear part of the pelvic floor muscles. And you can see that energy goes up the spine. Contracting the front of the anus, and you can see here how the energy goes up through the bladder, small intestines, stomach, thymus, thyroid, and the front of the brain. So you can pull your sexual energy up to different parts of the brain. I just did a practice today where, um, so I wake up in the morning, I ask my body and mind what it needs, and it said, I need energy in my brain, probably for doing this webinar so I can think clearly and speak clearly. So I did a lot of this practicing pulling up on each side of the perineum. Um, so the right side and energy goes up the right organs, see the liver or the right lung up to the brain and the left side, the left organs, the left kidney, left adrenal, left lung, left side of the brain left large intestine. So a lot of people don't really know all this about the jade egg practices, but it's really about circulating energy through the whole body and to different organs and to different parts of the brain. So we have another practice in the Tao Tantric Arts called ovarian breathing. So you learn how to capture the energy of the ovaries, because that's where a lot of the sexual energy is, and bring it down through the uterus, the vagina, into the whole clitoris, and then up the back channel through the sacral hiatus, and all the way up this channel here, all the way up to the crown. So you can see all the points and pumps on the back that refine energy to make them into energy that's good for the brain to digest and then the energy can come back down this direction. This is called the fire cycle when you go up the back and down the front. This is yang side of the body and this is the yin side of the body. So remember yang is fire, yin is water. You can also do the yin cycle which is going up the front or the water cycle and down the back. And then it's also showing how you can expand the microcosmic orbit and take it into the different leg roots and arm roots. So ovarian breathing is a really amazing meditation. I have it recorded on my, on my course for women, um, my Jade Egg course. I have an online course, and one whole chapter or module is dedicated to the microcosmic orbit and ovarian breathing. 
learning to breathe into the ovaries and capture the energy of the ovaries to circulate it through your whole body. So one of the things that I have found so beneficial about these practices is that it's really integrative. So it really connects your mind and your heart with your sexual organs. So it's really about connecting you as a being, your body, your mind, and your spirit. It's about connecting all of you. There's a beautiful picture from Minka DeVos, the Tao Tantric Arts for Women, where she's connecting her sexual center with her heart. So another practice in the Tao Tantric Arts for Women, um, which really helps to open the energy of the heart. So remember we said sometimes it's the emotional centers that need to be activated and opened first to awaken the sexual center. And this is precisely why we do uh, breast massage, breast and nipple massage in the Tao Tantric Arts for Women. So the breasts help to open the heart, massaging the breasts. And massaging the nipples also help to activate all of the gland so you might notice that you know having your nipples licked and kissed or sucked is very stimulating and it activates um, all kinds of hormones and also it activates your lubrication so self breast massage is done to open the heart and to prepare the body for um, sexual energy work either on your own or with a partner And there's different types of movements that you do to activate all these different glands in the body, showing all the glands, adrenal glands, thyroid, thymus, pineal and pituitary gland. And then a picture from The Art of Sexual Ecstasy, another amazing book by Margot and Anne, and I had the pleasure of meeting her at Hollyhock Retreat Center. And the Indian chakras also correspond with all the glands. So there's a lot of overlap between the two systems, uh, but they're just a little bit different. They grew in different parts of the world for thousands of years. So, um, now, uh, the best time for a woman to gather and circulate her ovarian energy or her sexual energy is from, so this is, this would be considered menstruation time, time when you're bleeding here, corresponding with the new moon, um, is from this time, so from the time you end bleeding, until the time you ovulate. So the full moon here is corresponding to a time where you ovulate. So this is the time when energy is increasing or expanding, and this is the time of the cycle, woman's cycle, when energy is decreasing or going inward. And uh, I love uh, this connection between the moon and the women's cycles. And this is another really important um, cycle to understand women's uh, sexual energy. This reconnection to our natural cycles or our moon cycle or our moon dance. So a couple great books that I'm going to be using is this one, Christian Northrop's Women Bodies, Women's Wisdom. And it shows that how we go from menstruation to ovulation and the different hormones that are involved. So we got um, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone that stimulate um, uh, different activities, uh, estrogen production and progesterone production, which also stimulate different activities from the egg being released to um, uh, all different aspects of the cycle. Um, and the thing that I wanted to illustrate more in this slide is to show how you can pay attention to your cycle and that can help you to connect to your body as well. So 
Um, here we're going from the menstrual cycle here where you're bleeding. This is showing the, the inner lining of the uterus um, sloughing off and as a result you get your, your blood. Um, this is also a time of new ideas, of an open mind and giving birth to new projects. So it's like, uh, you know, a birthing time. And then as you come to ovulation over here, um, you have a sense of accomplishment, creativity, activity. You've just birthed another little egg into your body. So um, you might feel really extroverted and outgoing and receptive to other people. The uh, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone are being activated during this phase and estrogen is high. During ovulation um, and around ovulation, um, you can relax, enjoy life, being re be receptive to being cared for, and then also start to begin your journey inward. This is where progesterone increases. Here is a, a it's a reflective time going back towards menstruation. Uh, where you might need to rest more and you might be reflecting on or evaluating how, you know, this cycle was. You may feel like you need to reorganize and be more introspective. Your intuition may be a lot higher during this time. You might have really powerful dreams um, and also feel a lot of the emotions that are just under the surface of what's going on inside of you. So a lot of people have really painful and difficult PMS um, with a lot of emotional uh, disturbances. And oftentimes those emotions are there and present. You just don't notice them during different parts of the cycle because, of the, because the hormones are different. But it does indicate things that need to be looked after um, and identified. So it's a very wise time. And it's possible to use the wisdom that happens during this time for transformation. So here's a little chart from Taking Charge of Your Fertility, a great book, showing the peaks of the different hormones. Uh, that's estrogen peaking right before ovulation, and that's luteinizing hormone to help the egg come out and the follicle stimulating hormone as well. Progesterone increases after ovulation. So I'm not again going into really specific details but just to show you that um, the this is the uterine lining showing the uterine lining and this is the cervical position. The cervical position actually uh, goes up and then drops right before ovulation. And the opening of the cervix opens more. And we also get the cervical fluid. Uh, this is really beneficial to understand because you can tell by what fluid is happening in your body when you're about to ovulate, as well as the position and the feeling of your cervix. So here's where you're having your period. This is where there's dry, there's nothing going on here. And then you start to notice something sticky, maybe like a, then a creamy white colored fluid, cervical fluid, and then the cervical changes to sort of egg white. It's stringy and long. And it's interesting because during ovulation, obviously that's the time where you can get pregnant, um, but we need these fluids for the sperm to swim in. So when it's really egg whitey and stringy, that's where the sperm can, that's the fluid that the sperm can swim the best in. And they can't swim in this dry, sticky stuff. So, but they can swim in this uh, egg whitey sort of fluid. Another way to tell when you're ovulating is, you know, to either avoid having a child or to have a child is by taking your waking temperature. So this book sort of takes you through your whole cycle. See, it shows a spike of temperature 
right around the time of ovulation. You can learn all about this and then track your whole cycle. There's the days, there's your temperature. So I did this for multiple months. Um, and oh, let's see what else is there. Um, there's all kinds of things. This is, you know, you're marking down the stars is when you're bleeding. And then you're talking about here what your cervical fluid is like, what the position of your cervix is like. Um, and you are talking about the description of your menstrual blood, the description of the cervical fluid, the kinds of exercise that you did, um, how you felt, um, you know? So when you start to learn your own cycle, you not only can you help yourself to get pregnant or prevent pregnancy, but you can also start to learn, you know, what you're like at different parts of your cycle, or you can plan things around different parts of your cycle as well. When to go out and to have a party at your house. Like you're not going to plan to have a party when you're menstruating. You're more likely to plan a party when you're ovulating and you feel like connecting to people and you're more extroverted. <coughs> Another picture of a woman just feeling her cervix and then testing the different kinds of cervical fluid throughout the cycle. So uh, that was very empowering to me to learn. Uh, I used that method uh, to not get pregnant for four and a half years with my partner um, and also the Taoist practices of seminal retention. He was practicing seminal retention and uh, basic withdrawal methods, uh, but also just making, you know, being careful to not have sex during times when I knew that I could get pregnant. So um, this has been quite a journey. I hope you've enjoyed it. And these are all the books that I used for my webinar. So I encourage you to visit also my website, which is uh, wildly, oops, this, which is wildlywoman.com. Let's see, just trying to do something here switch it from my webinar to, there we go. Yeah. So wildlywoman.com is the website where I have uh, a lot of my online education for women. So wildlywoman.com and um, also, intuneholistics.com is where I do uh, have a lot of my healing services. I do distance medical intuitive assessments so I can help people to understand what's going on with their sexual energy, uh, what they might need to do as far as, you know, seeing health practitioners or having tests done by doctors and such, uh, but also can kind of privately guide and support you on a journey uh, to sexual health and relationship health. I love doing this uh, type of work for couples, uh, helping couples to see what's going on with their sexual energy, how it's connecting, how it's not connecting, practices that they can do if they have different problems like impotence or you know whatever it may be. Oftentimes the emotions uh, are really connected to how we function in our sexual organs. So that's what being a medical intuitive affords me the ability to see um in people so i hope you enjoyed this webinar and um i will be doing it live every month on the first monday of the month and i it was always be different and uh i will be adding and subtracting and making it better as i go so Share it with your friends and thanks for joining. You can always send me an email to stephanie at intuneholistics.com um, if you have any questions. Thank you.